welcome everyone who has joined us so far and hopefully we'll have a few more along the way on the green feminist road um, i'm really delighted to welcome you to this welcome you to this webinar we're presenting local stories of sustainability in action and my name is jenny orlin i am the still recent membership and project manager at wilkes international secretariat um, based in geneva and for those of you attending who are WILT members and who don't know me yet, I'm really looking forward to meeting you as well and to working with you. Um, so this webinar is part of a series and it's entitled Down the Great Green Feminist Road. And that's also the title of a publication or a zine that WILT published um, on the World Environment Day, so on the 5th of June. And it tells the story of how WILT members uh, um, all over the world are taking action on environmental issues and all of the related issues um, that affect human security of women and of communities. Um, and with this uh, publication and with this webinars, we really wanted to make these grassroots actions visible. And we also hope that the stories will inspire um, others, uh, including ourselves, uh, to take action. We want to show that the feminist perspectives, um, how they join the dots between the environment and gender and peace. Uh, we see women leaders in the WILF network um, who witness the impacts of climate change, um, the conflicts that arise from struggles over natural resources, um, and the impacts of militarization on human health and on sustainability of communities. So uh, peace diplomacy is really at the forefront of addressing um, these environmental concerns. Um, and um, WILP's activism on environment as such is not really new. We see peace and security really from a holistic point of view. Uh, it's really directly linked to our positions on militarism, on the political economy, on human rights. It's really a human security perspective that we have on, on peace building. And, and that is why we have an environmental working group, which is led by our convener, Dawn Nelson, who is also our moderator today. Um, and Dawn uh, is a member of WILP USA and we're also very lucky to have her as our convener because she is um, she has a master's degree in environmental science and natural resources and her career focus has really been on environmental justice on peace building and on climate change um, so before I hand over to Dawn um, I just want to say a few words on the format of today's event. So we're going to have a round of presentations, uh, which will be moderated by Dawn. After each uh, presentation, we will have time for a couple of questions, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So um, at the end of the round of presentations, we will have an interactive Q&A with the audience. Um, and so just a short technical introduction on this. So your mic is mute. Um, to make sure there's no background noise uh, during the presentation, but we do hope to have a more interactive Q&A. Uh, and during that session, there are two ways in which you can participate. So one, you can type questions in the Q&A box that you should see on your screen. Um, and there we will collect your questions and try and reply to as many questions as possible. Or um, you can, if you want to ask your question or make a comment out loud rather than typing, uh, you can also raise your hand as a raise hand function that you should see on your screen and we will call on you and you can then and we will unmute your mic so you can speak um, and the last thing i will say is that we will record this uh, session so that other colleagues uh, and friends uh, can watch it uh, who weren't able to join us today and that's all i had to say and i'm very happy to hand over to don nelson thank you great thanks jenny can everybody hear me okay all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, the WILF Environment uh, webinar series is a very exciting uh, development for me as the Environment Working Group convener. I'm very happy to see uh, more discussion happening on the ground uh, among WILF members on environment and how it relates to militarism and peace building. And, you know, 2020 is really a year of waking up to what's happening on the ground and how we can learn from each other and foster collective action and build stronger movements uh, across nations. And WILP is a very unique organization that's, that's uh, uniquely situated to, to foster and the, that collective strength and, and uh, building alliances. So I'm very happy to have you join us today as we hear from some of our environmental peace grantees who have been doing work in their sections uh, respectively on the ground of environment and peace building 
and they will share with us some of the lessons that they've been learning and some of the challenges that they've been facing. And that essentially will spark a conversation that will continue on in this webinar series over the next several months where we'll be able to talk more about how environment and militarism intersect and how that also impacts uh, environmental justice and gender justice and uh, how this also informs and intersects with the issues of climate change and and water too as we shall see over the years as that unfolds and so we have uh, three three speakers joining us today they are uh, respectively uh, quite strong in their leadership of our WILF organization and I'm very pleased to have them join us and share their perspectives from on the ground we have Jamila Afghani, president of Wilf Afghanistan. We have Nuha Gosen, president of Wilf Lebanon. And Osa Muller Hansen, a board member of Wilf Norway. And they will each share in turn uh, a bit of what they've worked on over the course of the past year. And all of their stories can be found in our environmental zine, which was just released, as Jenny said, on World Environment Day on June 5th and goes into a bit more detail on each of the projects and you can find more information there as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. She will uh, talk about her project there in, in Wilf, Afghanistan, Jamila Afghani. She is a women's rights activist and religious peacemaker for the past 22 years. She has been leading uh, Medica Afghanistan which, is Afghanistan, which is a women support organization providing psychological, social, and legal services for uh, direct victims of gender-based violence. She has been working as, the, uh, as a volunteer for WILF, but also, also leading as the president and uh, has been working on the ground to, uh, with, with Afghani youth to develop a project that is basically to plant trees within the community and to foster peace and do some grassroots peace building. She is the, also the a member of the WILF International Board representing the South Asian countries since 2019 and is actively engaged in UN level advocacy. Uh, and for her work, she has also been awarded uh, the um, she, in 2019, she received the Award of Women of Courage from the USA Embassy in Kabul for her work on the ground with Afghani youth. So welcome, Jamila. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are very excited to hear from you. And with that, take it away. This climate and pollution in, in our country is getting very worse day by day. Because of the war, some of the jungles uh, are destroyed by government because most of the time warriors are hiding themselves behind the trees. Due to severity of the cold, lots of the trees were cut off. Most of people do not have uh, better economical resources. They are cutting the jungle for firewood and uh, people are using not only woods but also coal and also plastic rubber it has created a lot of pollution in the environment most of people have got respiratory problem large number of people were sick especially children and women that's why Wolf Afghanistan is also working with men, women, and you to, to promote uh, culture of peace, not only in their personal uh, social life, but also for their environment. Afghanistan has very beautiful trees. Last year, we cultivated more than 10,000 uh, trees and young girls were looking after the trees for, uh, for watering the tr trees and female teachers were giving us report for, for growth of the trees. And hopefully in the next two years, these 
trees will bring in fruit. <laughs> at least at the moment, they are contributing to our oxygen <laughs> in a way or other way. We had different um, uh, discussion with local community about the usage of coal and um, plastic. And uh, usually, you're using tanur. Tanur, like, it's a big hole that in which we put fire and which we cook. It is done by women, and then their health is also very badly impacted. So we were also communicating with women about the usage of proper resources in, in their tanur. Unfortunately, I wish those money which is spent in war, it was spent on development of the country. It could have been very, very different situation. So women can be playing very major role for promoting feminist approach of uh, environmental justice. We are hopeful for uh, future and we are hopeful for a better future for our children and for next generation of our country. Uh, uh, hi everybody, um, uh, in our time it's <laughs> evening and whatever timing is for everybody, I wish everybody good time. Uh, you saw the clip, I think uh, it had lots of uh, sayings for you all, but uh, I will share with you um, a few uh, learning points we have learned from implementing this, uh, this project. Uh, in 2019, uh, we had uh, the opportunity to cultivate um, uh, uh, 10,000 trees with support of students and female teachers in Kabul uh, provinces of Afghanistan, which was very uh, good learning experience. And from that, students and teachers, uh, they have become very actively engaged in their environment and uh, for for uh, caring their environment. And this year on volunteer basis, all the families, all the, uh, the environment, uh, in their environment, they have cultivated um, voluntarily a uh, large number of trees. And uh, from the other side this year, we were facing the pandemic of Corona and uh, we also use this opportunity to communicate uh, with our uh, members, with our colleagues and friends that if we do not care about our environment, such a pandemic and such a worse condition can happen to us. And uh, we are uh, uh, helping women, especially in Afghanistan, most of women are uneducated, they are illiterate. They're living in a very far-sighted areas. Uh, they do not have access to uh, internet or uh, any other social media. So through our volunteers, uh, we are conveying the message and uh, they are taking important notice that they have to care about their environment and it is for their benefit and for the benefit of their own life and their own health and their family health and life. And uh, uh, women uh, can play very important role, uh, but they need the awareness, uh, which is very important for them to be involved in the society. Unfortunately, in our country, in our society, women are uh, considered as a secondary citizens of the country. They are not in this decision making role. Always they have kept aside and they have not been involved. But when through our experience, when women are get involved and they can see that uh, their contribution is uh, counted, not maybe in terms of uh, financial resources, 
but at least in their environment, the peace they are uh, noticing around them within their family, that is very much rewarding. And women are getting much more interested and they are getting enthusiastic to, to, to be involved in their society. And um, now WILF, which has uh, uh, more than 10,000 members in Afghanistan, and we have uh, small groups all around the country in 34 provinces of the, our country. And this year, um, everybody, our member, contributed three trees, uh, cultivated three trees um, in their own uh, uh, living area, maybe in their office area, or maybe in their school everywhere. So the report we are getting from our members from all around Afghanistan, it shows that uh, now they are on, on, on their own uh, volunteer basis, they are cultivating trees and looking after their environment. And especially they are also raising awareness on the usage of the material, which can be hazardous to our society, to our environment. And uh, uh, this initiative, which was a very small starting point, but uh, now we can see it's growing, just like a tree with, uh, with a small seed which was cultivated, and now it's growing up, and hopefully it will be a tree with uh, lots of leaves and with lots of fruits and <laughs> with better and larger contribution to our society. Thank you everybody for your attention. Great, thank you, Jamila. It's really good to hear what's how that project has come to fruition for you. I have been um, kind of very curious actually to see for myself on the ground how that's evolved. And so I want to ask you, um, you know, like what has been a particularly challenging aspect of, of completing this project and what wisdom have you gained uh, in that process that you could share with other WILF members? As I said before, like um, uh, women are uh, having secondary role in our society and uh, it was challenging in the beginning to to convince women that they can also contribute in their environmental justice and in their environmental peace. So um, it was difficult and they were saying like men are doing this job, this is outside uh, home activity and uh, they were not taking interest. But when we start uh, conveying the message and we start um, awareness sessions, um, and women realize that they can contribute very much in their society. Like if they are doing household activity, they can uh, control the usage of water, the usage of plastic, <laughs> and these things, uh, how much contributed to their economy and also contributed to their uh, environment. Uh, so when they got to know and they realized, uh, they became very much uh, helpful for us and also for their society. So uh, the, in the beginning, it was difficult to, to make them realize and give them the message. But when they got the message, now they are spreading message to many other women around them. Great, thank you. We have a, a question also from the audience from Mary Beth Gardam. Uh, where do the trees come from? Like who is, who is donating the trees? Um, uh, initially, we uh, had a, an agreement with Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, on an annual basis, they have uh, lots of uh, trees to, 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 uh, to be, uh, um, um, to put it, <laughs> or maybe to cultivate it. Um, and this we did with an, a joint venture with Ministry of Agriculture. We got the trees and also uh, our members, um, they provided us some donation for the, uh, for the trees. And we uh, had a, a little bit number of purchased tree, but a large number was coming from Ministry of Agriculture. And with Ministry of uh, in Education, in consultation with Ministry of Education, we did uh, the implementation of the trees in different uh, areas which need uh, care and attention from the school teachers and the students who, who were 
uh, helping us in this project. Great, thank you, Jamila. We have time for one more question before uh, moving on, and then we can also, there will be time for more questions at the end of uh, uh, all of the presenters uh, speaking. So if, if there's any more questions, we have uh, time for one more. Can maybe add that there are a lot of people in, uh, very inspired and impressed by the video in the comments. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jamila. We really appreciate all the work that you've been doing on the ground and to come today and, and share that with other WILF members. It's really beautiful to see. And so- um, Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you so much. And we have our, our next presenter is uh, Nuha Gosen, is pre president of WILF Lebanon. And she has been working with Syrian refugees uh, on her project uh, for the environmental peace building uh, grants. Uh, for, and has been working with these refugees for the last several years and is going to share with us a bit about uh, what her project has been to work uh, in a refugee camp and to build community there. And she has been working on human rights activist work now for several years and will be um, giving us some insights on what it means to, to live and work in a river community in a, in a refugee camp and to really try to forge forward on a number of fronts simultaneously, which is quite an undertaking. So uh, with that, uh, we welcome Nuha and, and, uh, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, everyone. First, I want to thank the Environment Working Group for giving us the opportunity to share our story. Thank you, listeners, too. Our story is a mosaic of mixed emotions. At times we were happy, satisfied, optimistic, encouraged, but for most of the time, we experienced anger, distrust, and helplessness. But the worst experience, the worst experience, is when you witness a 12 years old child barefooted, with cracked hands from working in the fields, lacking basic hygiene, looking at you with emotionless eyes. This is when you feel how weak are the international community and nations to stop wars and put an end, put an end to conflicts and wars around the world. And you know, wars affect children and women the most. We look, we took a, a confirmed decision to help refugees, to help the refugees will pick a remote, a very remote camp in Saad Nail Bika Valley. It's like one hour and a half from Beirut, where I live. It's called Camp 003 with 70 tents. And in these tents live 68 women and 145 children. Its inhabitants fled their homes with no money to settle in cluster tents that lack the minimum requirements for, for survival. Each family had to rent a tiny piece of land. Sometimes the, the land is two meters by two meters. That means four square meters, just to build a tent. And they have to build the tent themselves. Um, and to, be, to build, to build the tent, they have to pay like sometimes $1,000, sometimes $500. It depends on where the, the piece of land is. And they have to supply, um, you know, the marinas and everything that goes with the tent and, and build it themselves. Our first task when we went there, our first task was to collect information. So we interviewed people of all ages. We interviewed men, women, and children sometimes, collecting data, listening to hardships and problems they are facing. Listening to them was agonizing, but seeing was more painful, really. Just to look at them and see their faces and see the way they live, where they live, it's heartbreaking. 
but seeing was more painful and unacceptable. Tents were torn by winds, empty, with no stuff or equipment necessary for survival. This was our starting point. Can you please display picture one, two, three? We had to provide mattresses, blankets, mats to cover the dirt inside the tents, kitchen utensils and the like. You know, um, in the first picture, this is, this is how they greeted us. Please, please help. Can you see? And um, in the second picture, you can see the trucks. We had like three, four trucks full of um, mats and mattresses. We were done with, uh, with the basics. Now, we, we then started collecting food. Now, uh, the money was, was spent, so we started collecting food. Please, can you put the other four pictures? Yes. Um, we started collecting food from our ho homes, and uh, we, we collected, we packed them in boxes. Uh, we put oil, we put uh, rice, uh, lentil, uh, sugar, tea, uh, coffee. We, uh, most of all, most of all, uh, milk for the kids. As, after, after providing uh, somehow decent living tents, our concern was a safe, clean environment. And you can, this is, this is, you know, we had worse pictures than these, but um, these are uh, photographed after we cleaned some of the debris that was there. Uh, you know, as you see, paths between tents were infested with litter and sewage water. So, and, and between the tent and the tent, you can see only 50 centimeters, like less than a meter between the tent because because there were 70 tents in a very small area. So the paths were invested with litter and sewage water. This was due to lack of basic infra infrastructure installation for sewage and water. So they had the tents, but they didn't have the means of, you know, uh, taking, care of, taking care of the sewage and the dirty water. We had we were, we were very lucky because we had to collaborate with the Norwegian task force that was, that was in, uh, uh, that was in uh, a place near Sadnaye. And the task force helped us build pipes from tents to big sewage reservoirs. Uh, they did, and we, thank, we were very thankful because you know half of the polluted site was gone. Uh, another concern was the river. So we, we are done with the pathways between the tents and then we, there's a river uh, that, a branch of the Litani River, kind of a stream that runs along the side of the camp. The river is usually almost dry during summer. And uh, it, 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 it was used, the river was used as, as dump yard. They, they dumped all their garbage, their debris, their bottles, used diapers, animal carcasses, and some tents had their sewage and dirty water uh, pipes drawn into the river. So it was really a very filthy, filthy river. Uh, and as you see the, the, in the picture, we had rotten, stagnant water basin that has become a breeding ground for all kinds of mosquitoes, parasites, bacteria, and rodents, mainly rat, rats and snakes. You know, rats and snakes have been found in tents for putting children in harm's way. This was a clear cut picture of what the refugee camp looked like. After seeing and learning all this, our work was to prioritize our work. We have to prioritize our work. The second, the second thing was we had to do was uh, talk, to the, talk to the people, ask them what they want, what they need. So refugees lost faith in all, after talking to, the, to them, they told me that we, we lost faith in all NGOs because they, NGOs come, promise, take pictures, and they leave, but no work was done. Our first, first activity, our first activity uh, 
was to gather women and talk to them and listen to their problems. You know, you cannot do anything unless you listen to, the, to people. What are their needs? What do they expect from you? So the refugees' main problem was rain and storm. Uh, they, they told me that tents become inundated during storms and, and heavy rain, mattresses drenched, which made it impossible for sleep for many nights. Another problem they uh, told me about was rent. They told me that rent was too high and the electric bill, electricity bill was too high, like 50 to $80 a month, and they are not working. They don't have money. Uh, uh, because, and the third problem is that because they don't have, they needed cash to survive and they don't have the cash ready, parents send children to work in fields. Children work picking fruits and vegetables from fields from eight in the morning till four and, or five in the evening. And they will get like $3 or $4 max. And another problem was patriarchal culture. You know, although 80% of the refugees consist of women, yet one male known as a shawish is in control of the whole camp. He's a dictator figure, a dictator figure, really a dictator figure that is, is feared by most women and children in the camp. And, and worse than that, women in most cases had to please him to get what they needed. This was, you know, we couldn't, we could, we could <laughs> understand everything, but we couldn't, we couldn't pass beyond this. So it was urgent, an urgent need to find a women leaders to take hold of their own life instead of one male figure taking hold of the whole 60 women. So we, we should find, uh, we, we decided to find women leaders to take hold of their own life. A WILF member called Hasna Case conducted many workshop training training women on leadership. And it was so, so uh, interesting. I, I was interested in what she was teaching the women. And uh, leadership skills, she, she uh, gave like three hours on problem solving skills. She educated them on their rights. Can you see picture nine, please? Nine and 10, nine and on. Yep, we yes. can see them. Yes. And just a, yeah. a couple more minutes. Uh, oh, okay. To wrap up to. Thank you. Okay. So this is Hasna teaching teaching them. Uh, meeting in tents was inconvenient. Tents were small, incapable of accommodating all women eager to learn. So we decided on the next step. The next step was building a community center. And. All the past activities were carried by volunteers from WILF. Hasna alone conducted eight workshops engaging women and children. Uh, the center created a sufficient material foundation upon which women can meet, socialize, plan, solve problems, and use available resources from internet, TV, and conduct workshops. We conducted workshops in the center, lectures, discussed problems, and find solutions. It is also used to educate children. 60% of the camp children were illiterate. Building the center was a success. Wolf hired a teacher to teach two hours every day, a class in the morning for children who were unable to read and write. Um, she worked for three months and then she stopped because she needed more money and we couldn't afford to give her more. Uh, it was used as a recreational center to guide, guide a, a young WILF member uh, from Lebanon, spent three sessions with children teaching them to draw, paint, and other fun activities, and, uh, in which they expressed their feelings and desires. Excited and happy children welcoming, you see this, this, this picture, welcoming uh, guide when she came. Uh, we are really sad to be forced to stop visiting the camp 
First, because of the upcoming revolution in October 17, you know, the roads were blocked uh, by uh, anti-government protesters and demonstrators. And then COVID-19, uh, the unwelcomed visitor and the lockdown distancing also prohibited us from checking on them. We are constantly calling. I'm calling every like week, once a week, sometimes just showing that you care will fill their hearts with pleasure, empower them to endure their hard life. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your project and the details on the ground. And I, I, I understand it's, it can, um, it's a very emotional work and that can yes. take a, a lot out of uh, a, a, a person in a, in a community. And so um, I just want to quickly ask you before we move on, you know, is there a certain way, I mean, given that it's a small river community, is there a certain way that the community came together that you feel was unique and kind of lent unique strength to achieving the project goals? Uh, you, you see, uh, first, we all know that refugees are victims. They are not aggressors. So, so uh, all the community at first came together to help them. Even, even um, the, the poor families. You know, sometimes uh, I get donations from families that they can barely uh, live. Uh, when Israel attacked Lebanon in 2006, many buildings were, you know, it, 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 it was a war, a war and um, families had to leave, Lebanese families had to leave and go to Syria. So the, Syrian, the Syrians welcomed the, Lebanese, the refugees from Lebanon. So when the, the crisis in Syria happened, the Lebanese did not forget their hosts in Syria. So they, they, start, they really, really welcomed the refugees the first two years. And they, they, uh, that's why refugees are scattered all over Lebanon, because they don't live in camps. Uh, the, the second and the third year when, when villages were, you know, they couldn't take any more refugees, then the refugees started living in camps. Uh, um, you know, exposing all the atrocities the Syrian regime uh, uh, was inflicted on its own people. We saw this on television and, uh, and the media exposure created a, wa a wave of sympathy among the Lebanese for Syrian refugees. So yes, when the, uh, and, and when the war started in 2011, Lebanese expressed their apathy by hosting them. But three years later, you know, the Lebanese uh, refugees stayed two months in Syria only. I think it was, it was July and, and August. But uh, when the refugees and uh, the Syrian refugees in Lebanon had to stay like four, five, six years, uh, it, it became a burden on the Lebanese uh, people. And I think help and um, enthusiasm lessened a little bit. Well, thank and you so much for sharing your insights. We, yeah. sh we, sh we need to keep, keep moving a little bit, but I want to also uh, share with you that there are a lot of WILF members right now uh, asking to volunteer to help you clean that river. So uh, we oh. might be able to deploy a WILF uh, workforce on the ground to help you. So we have our next speaker, uh, Osa Muller Hansen, is a board member of WILF Norway. And Osa has lived outside of Bergen in Norway uh, since 1990. She has been working as an advisor for refugees and immigrants, uh, teaching and organizing information programs and vocational training. Uh, last year, she just retired as a senior advisor, so she's now able to focus on social movements for peace, justice, and sustainable development, which has been a very important part of her life. And she joined WILP in 2002 during the worldwide struggle to stop the war on Iraq. And since then has been organizing and co-organizing workshops, lectures and exhibitions and written many articles about culture of peace, environment and the costs of, mili of militarism and redefining security. Eh? As a part of her WILP small grant, she wrote a small book called Protecting Who about military greenhouse emissions war as a business idea and roads to peace. Uh, and so with that, 
uh, welcome Osa and we look forward to hearing about your project. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, also thank you very much to Nuha and Jamila for their story, which was very touching. Yes. And what you see here is a picture of our group in Bergen. It's, it's an extended group. It's also people joining us at a special day. So, um, but some of us are in the WILP group in Bergen. So I want to tell a little bit the, the work we have been doing in Bergen, the, in Norway. Um, we were very shocked to hear about the use of depleted uranium in Iraq um, after the war started in Iraq. So they were used the depleted uranium in Iraq in 1991 and in 2003. And uh, Wilf Bergen and also Norway, well, we joined the international campaign to abolish uranium uh, uh, weapons, ICBU. So we joined the campaign for many years, but we very soon understood that war and militarism um, had a very many more destructive impacts on the environment. So we started to uh, extend the work against militarism, it's very destructive impact on the environment. So today, with maybe 10 years to prevent an irreversible um, global warming, we see that the military is just doing business as usual. They're still emitting very much greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And no, no one is uh, stopping them. There is, uh, no one is talking about this. Environmental group, they don't uh, address the military very much. And that was the situation we have been uh, kind of trying to uh, change for many years. And so uh, we got this uh, grant from um, WILP and could uh, working in a more systematic way with this. So we uh, made this little book called uh, Also, something went wrong with your sound there. Oh, okay. Is it better yeah. now? Is it You're better back. now? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. So we, we think this is a very big paradox. The military institutions are paid and said to protect people and nations, but on a global scale, they are increasing the global warming and the environmental destruction of ecosystems and the planet. And also the livelihoods for the coming generations. So this is a very huge problem that we try to address in this little book. So, um, the, the, I want to talk a little bit about this book. Uh, the first part of the book is about uh, military pollution to air, water and soil and the waste of very precious resources that goes to the military. So uh, it's uh, statistics and it's uh, descriptions of uh, different uh, kinds of pollutions. So it's a, the main thing is about the global warming and the military pollution. Uh, like uh, the United States, they, uh, the military there is the single biggest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. And also other national militaries and the arms industry worsen the climate crisis very much. And we have to talk about this. So the part two is about uh, why we cannot disarm, why it's so difficult to disarm in these times. You know, in Norway, uh, Norway is a part of NATO and NATO is building up militarily in Norway very much. And uh, the media tells us and the politicians tells us that this is uh, for our security, but it's a part of a global uh, arms race. It's a part of uh, geopolitics. 
so um, so media is one of the obstacles to uh, to disarmament. But uh, I think maybe the worst that we can ident uh, identify is the military industrial complex. And also the economic system that is totally dependent on arms sales and destructions of ecosystems. And uh, of course, also old patriarchal ideas and institutions. So these are the trying to identify the obstacles. So the part three is uh, focusing on solutions uh, promoted by the United, State, United Nations and uh, many NGOs, for instance, WILF, by many, many years from 1990s and the Rio Conventions. So that work was uh, being started already then. But it's a lot of work has been done and it's easy to find it and to use it and to promote it today. So we have distributed this little book and also many flyers um, to target groups like politicians, uh, some journalists, uh, environmental activists, and um, others. And um, in the aftermath of uh, releasing, releasing this book, uh, I was um, invited to hold uh, small speeches around in different places in Norway and also one in Sweden. So sometimes they had some media coverage and we had also been able to discuss this with young politicians and uh, some environmental groups, young people. So, so in a way, I think the aim of the project was to create awareness in, the, in Norway about these problems and to, to start to discuss it. And, and the aim is also to try to um, talk about and discuss what is giving us uh, security, safety, what, what can protect our environmental and our planet. So, um, hand in hand with this book, we also had another uh, project in Bergen, which is about um, po polluting, military pollution of the fjords. So maybe you can see this, postcards. So it says um, no to nuclear submarines in Norwegian fjords, protect life underwater. And it's also um, um, connected to the SDG, Sustainable Development, Development Goal 14, protect life underwater. So this has been a part of the uh, campaign. So it's a broader campaign than this, uh, only this uh, small book. And we had uh, some exhibitions, we had a workshop where we made some <laughs> submarines like this, this, this size to um, exhibit and, um, in a shop, in one shop, a bookstore, and in um, a library and in a municipal building. So we had these uh, small exhibitions around in Bergen. And we also have this beautiful, <laughs> small octopuses, which are made in Syria by refugee women. And we buy them from them in Bekaa Valley. So that's also part of the campaign. Yes. So we still work with this and uh, try to uh, to make this uh, big discussion about the uh, security concept to uh, change the way we think about security. So that will be uh, we will be working with this also in the autumn, and we will uh, we are planning an art exhibition in September, which is called um, uh, yeah, it's it's against war but also for peace. And uh, 15, 16 artists will uh, contribute with works they have done from paintings and uh, photos and uh, sculptures. And uh, the thing, we want to make um, reflections, discuss, make, make a public room for public dis uh, space for discussions around uh, peace 
and war and uh, disarmament in, in our times of climate crisis. Great. Thank you, Osa. We really appreciate you coming to, to share uh, your insights and, and on your project. Did you have any, any you last much. things you wanted to share before we move on to taking questions? No, I think it's fine. Yeah. So one of the, the questions that we have from Mary Beth is, is the booklet available in English? And how can mm -hmm. people contact you about the military's contamination of water uh, using PFAS firefighting foam? Yes. No, the book is only in Norwegian. We made a leaflet in, uh, in uh, English uh, earlier about this. Uh, so which we distributed in Berlin under the IPB uh, conference some years ago. But uh, the book is only in Norwegian. And if you want to contact us, maybe you can give her my address, Dawn. Can you do that? Or maybe Elena, so we can be in touch about this. We can do that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so I think we can now move on to the, the full round of discussion. Thank you, Osa, for sharing uh, your project again. And we have, uh, we do have someone that's been patiently waiting to ask uh, her question. Uh, so I want to yield the floor to Basaratu first. And then from there, we can open up to a, a broader discussion where everyone can ask questions uh, of each of our speakers and we'll take them uh, in turn, as uh, the case may be. So uh, go ahead, Basaratu. La question c'est de savoir de, de, le mouvement d'ensemble des féministes pour pouvoir récupérer tout ce que les gens mettent comme déchets à travers les villes. Comment est-ce qu'on pourra les récupérer afin de, 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 de diminuer la pollution à travers la planète? Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Alors, on va, je veux euh, parquer cette question pour la discussion à la fin, parce que c'est en relation à, à, la, à la présentation sur Liban. Ok. D'accord. Merci. 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 Excusez-moi de vous. Pas du tout. So uh, the question from Basiratu was um, for Noa actually, and maybe we can come back to that in the end in the discussion. It was about the um, the, the letter. And the feminist movement for for uh, for litter against litter, I should say. Is that okay, Don? Yeah. Um, I also just before we move on, I had a couple of comments also in the chat box. Uh, one from Tamara, who says, "I think NATO is one of the greatest threats to the climate," and she wrote an article uh, published in several newspapers. So we can share that with everyone at the in the end. And they're trying to stop Canada from participating in the US-led naval war games, the war games, um, which is very destructive to the Pacific Ocean. So she also sent a link to sign the petition. So again, we will, we will share that with everyone. And finally, a publication on demilit demilitarization for decarbonization about the military's climate impacts. Thank you very much, Tamara, and we'll share those links. Okay, so I think we can move now to a full discussion. So there's a couple of ways that folks can uh, ask questions. You can ask a question in the Q&A box there at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, if, if that's not accessible to you, you can also uh, post it in the chat box. Uh, and you can also raise your hand and we can unmute your mic and you can participate in the discussion that way. So uh, with that, I would like to, to um, invite folks to ask questions of each of our speakers or and to um, and to, or if you have uh, comments uh, on any of the projects, uh, to please feel free to share and we'll spend a, a few minutes uh, on this discussion. We have a question from Jennifer uh, to Jamila, which is that she is, um, she's, thank you so much for sharing your experience and she's wondering if your project faces challenges due to the unsecure situation in Afghanistan. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, I don't know what's wrong with my camera. I couldn't turn it on. <laughs> but you can hear my voice, I'm sure. Uh, uh, actually, this project was uh, done in Kabul. Uh, relatively, Kabul is um, relatively having better security situation. Uh, 
most of the time, so, but sometimes major attacks also takes place in Kabul, explosions. Uh, but this uh, project was implemented in very far-sighted area uh, outside of the crowd and we had an, any major problem. And uh, Afghanistan itself, it's an agriculture country. People are uh, very much involved in agriculture around themselves. So as our uh, project was or is for cultivation of the tree or uh, uh, implementation of the trees, so we didn't face any major security problem uh, during implementation of the project. Great, thank you. And Jenny, did you want to, to pose the question to Noha? Yeah. Yes, so for Noha, um, this was about the, the Lebanon presentation from Basiratou Traoré in uh, Wilf Togo. And uh, she's asking um, just in, in more general terms, how can the feminist movement um, mobilize better to also look at, at waste and, and, and that kind of uh, pollution in cities? Um, what are the lessons, I, I guess she's asking, what are the lessons uh, she can take from your project um, to also do something similar in the city, uh, in Lome, where she is based? Thank you for asking. Uh, frankly speaking, women's rights is, is on the rise. And, and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, demonstrations and demonstrations in Lebanon are led by women, mainly women. And uh, as a result, we see like four uh, ministers now, before, be three years ago, four years ago, we, they were all men. So women are, are uh, acquiring more and more rights because they're working towards it. You know, they are very active, really active, and they are, they are strong. Now they are strong. So I think, we're on the right track. Thank you, did, and I did I did I answer your questions? So, in terms of the um, of of the litter and the pollution in the cities, um, I think she's concerned about the same problem in her city. Um, so, your your uh, response is that um, it's it's first about ensuring that the women um, mobilize together. Is that right? Yeah, but and you know, this is the government issue. Yeah, the, gov the government should should take action, and yeah. we have a very a very uh, uh, I can't say incompetent government, and that's why we have a revolution to to topple it. And they are incompetent, incompetent, and they're uh, they're about gaining money to their pockets, more than gaining uh, rights to the government. So that's why we have a re revolution. And next week, you will see all women on the streets, definitely. It's, it's, so uh, litter is one issue, but we have a lot of issues. We, we don't have electricity for the last five, six years. And we pay two bills, one for the government and one for the uh, private. Uh, providers of electricity. So everything is not working in, in uh, Lebanon because of not only litter, because of the government, because of the incompetent government. That's why we have to place more women because women, women can work better than men. I'm very sorry to say that. Thank you, Noha. Great, thank you. We have a question from uh, Adelia. Are we planning, uh, this is kind of a more of a, a general question, but um, specific to some of the regional conflict. So are we planning as WILF to do something connecting environment and the urgent need to cease fire in Afghanistan and Syria, addressing UN Security Council on the 20th anniversary of 1325? That is a good and very big question. I don't know, Elena, if you are able to help us with that one otherwise it's something we can come back to because we need our colleagues from the MENA team yeah. on this one. Yes. Yeah. 
similarly, we have um, a question from Mary Beth. Uh, in what ways will WILP International help to connect sections to be able to support projects of one another? While we don't do direct service projects here in the US favoring advocacy, we might be able to co coordinate with other sections to support their work and also share the information from our advocacy and analysis to help support their efforts. Uh, so kind of uh, riding the heels of the last question there, but if um, you want to add any uh, context to that. Well, I think that's a really good question and I'd be really interested in hearing ideas from you all uh, as well. I think what we're trying to do so far is sharing as much as we can information about what WILF sections are doing. Um, and we also have My WILF, which is this online platform only accessible to WILF members. Um, but I, I think it's something that we should look into better. And um, as we move forward with the membership role now, um, I'd really welcome your ideas on that. We have a question for Jamila. Are there plans or resources to expand the project in areas outside of Kabul? Uh, it seems to have a great impact on making women more aware of their important role and that their involvement makes a difference. Uh, so any, any plans to expand uh, outside of Kabul? Uh, Jamila. Um, <clears throat> actually, at the moment, we are not having any financial resource to extend our activity in other provinces. Uh, but uh, through support of our members in 20 and 34 provinces, uh, like uh, they have done their contribution or they are doing on volunteer basis. But of course, for such uh, activity in larger scale, there is need of funding. And hopefully, if we are able to get funding, uh, definitely we, we replicate this project in other provinces, which is really needed um, in a country which is almost uh, in war and conflict for the past more than 40 years. And mostly, we have ruined our uh, environment, our basic uh, infrastructure, everything. But this year we did it through our members voluntarily in smaller uh, uh, scale in all provinces. All right, great, thank you. And uh, we have a uh, kind of a, a comment, uh, I suppose, more than a question, but uh, Jennifer Bailey uh, just says that uh, regarding the question about supporting the ceasefire in the Middle East, she understands the UN is advocating a ceasefire due to COVID. 19 is uh, if there are any comments from speakers on, on that specifically uh, feel free i have another comment from uh, nancy price who says um, our earth democracy committee is working with the national priorities project on no war no warming linking the peace and climate groups um, so perhaps there could be some cross-sectional work on this effort yeah and Tamara again is saying in, in Canada, we're mobilizing to stop the Canadian government from buying a new fleet of fighter jets, uh, $19 billion for 88 fighter jets. And one of the things we're raising is the climate impacts of these new combat aircrafts. And in fact, the similar thing is happening in Switzerland at the moment, who are about to have a referendum about buying fighter jets. Great, thank you. We have yeah. uh, a hand up uh, again from uh, Basura too, if you'd like to ask. A follow-up question. If you can unmute her mic. Allez-y, Basiratou. Oui, bon, mais j'ai juste uh, le temps de dire uh, merci à tout le monde, à tout un chacun, à tous les Wilfers, à Elena, à vous toutes, et merci pour nous avoir associés à cette rencontre. Que ça se passe bien et que nous portons haut le flambeau. De l'écologie. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Vasiratou. Oui. So, a thank you from from Wilf Togo for for this session and for for the participation of all the and a greeting to all the Wilfers, and uh, let's continue waving the flag for the feminists. I have one more comment here from Mary Beth a Garden. <laughs> The Women, Money and Democracy Issue Committee of WILF US is also working on a project to connect military support to the economic issue of debt. War fuels debt and debt fuels war. 
And so with that, I'd like to thank our speakers and everyone for joining us today. It has been a fantastic event and I am very pleased to see this environment webin webinar series take off. I invite you to attend our next webinar in the series on July 14th titled uh, Leveraging the Sustainable Development Goals for Prevention and Peace. It will bring together feminist leaders to discuss the ways the SDGs can advance our advocacy for a feminist future based on peace and human rights. It will provide a space to discuss our local and global work for, for development justice and feminist peace within the SDGs framework, uh, which is very timely as the high level political forum is now taking place uh, coming up next week in New York. Uh, technically is taking place in person, but is largely virtualized. So it will be uh, broadcast on UN Web TV. So more people will actually be able to engage uh, SDGs this year. And so after this uh, webinar closes, we will send out lots of information about our speakers and all of the uh, links and things discussed today, and then also a registration link for our next webinar. And the recording will also be available shortly uh, after. So thank you so much uh, for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again and take care. Thank you. Thank you so much also Dawn for moderating this discussion and for everyone for showing up. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.